Yeah, thank you, Lydia. Um, can you see that screen all okay now? Yeah, that's great. Thanks, Jörg. And um, you can hear me all right? Yes, very clear. All right, excellent, excellent. Well, morning, everyone. Uh, thanks very much for joining us, and um, uh, thanks ever so much for all of the work that you do. Um, having eyes on the ground is is unbelievably useful, and um, I've come up against that this morning in the respect of uh, one of the projects I'm working on. There was a guy that I was calling was telling me about stuff that's just happened in the last couple of months that I wasn't aware of. So um, eyes on the ground is amazingly useful. So keep up the hard work, and thanks ever so much. Um, I'm just here to talk about just how important uh, soils are. If it looks like I'm looking down, I've got two cameras and the one's a bit further up than the other one. But, um, and it's really important that we, I stress at this stage, that soils are really important, but they're also really complicated. But I don't want it to sound like they're too complicated that people can't get involved in them. There's more to do with the fact that they're so diverse, they're so brilliant, and they do so many things that anybody who tells you they're a soil expert is either got really high expectations of themselves or they're actually more of an expert in a specific aspect of soils and I'll, I'll touch on that as we go through this but they're, they're absolutely brilliant but they absolutely complicate things no end so i thought i'd start off here by looking at um a little bit of a landscape this is east devon uh, for those of you who are in or know east devon a little bit i don't know whether my cursor is showing up but you've got the house there at picton college and this is the, the lower Otter Valley. Uh, so you've got the Picton Gardens, and then this is the Picton um, uh, Gardens. The, the Dutchy um, College owned now a Cornwall College's um, estate school for um, agricultural students, well, agricultural and countryside students. And then the rest of the ground here then is um, all agriculturally uh, managed land with a little bit of the pebble bed heath just coming into view up here on the top left hand side. But hopefully you'll be able to see when I flick through over to now, the number of fields has changed considerably in the respect of there's far fewer fields now than there used to be, which is to do with the, um, the economies of scale and the ease of management when you're moving between um, the fields and the actual activities you can do within those fields. But as soon as you start to change the landscape in that way, you're beginning to change the landscape in a more it was done for ease. It was done with regard to post um, World War II. The government was telling us we needed to be much more self-sufficient and we needed to push the land a little bit harder to get more back. The difficulty with that is you start taking out edges and things like that. It changes the dynamic and the hydrology within a catchment and hopefully we'll, we'll touch on all of that in a second. But if I just flip back between the two, one of the areas that you can see quite a large change in number of fields is this area here. You can see there's an awful lot of fields. If you change it to now when there's just the fall, essentially, there's a, that's a track across one of the fields, although they sometimes treat this field slightly differently. But you'll see there's quite a range um, of differences in between what was there before and what there is there now. One of the things that a lot of people don't always take on board um, is the fact that a lot of hedgerows are put in and they're not just a demarcation between who owns which field and who um, owns the next. They're put in there as a obviously as a barrier to contain stock and um, obviously a boundary so you do know who owns what. But very often they will follow changes in soil types, not in all circumstances, but very often they will change in soil types. So when you knock out a boundary, a hedgerow boundary between that used to have three or four within the field and you turn it into one field, there's a good chance you'll have at least one extra soil type in there that you thought you had in the respect that you instead of dealing with one soil type, you were dealing with two or sometimes even three or four. And each of those soil types will have their inherent uh, capabilities. And it's important that the, the landowner or the farmer at that point is actually understanding that and doesn't just treat that one field as a, a single entity. And that's obviously the beauty of the historic knowledge where they knew that there were different soil types, so they, they contained them in a different way. And that made the whole management of that um, much more uniform in the respect of, well, you can't go in that field at the moment. We'll have to wait another week for that one, whereas this one is drier. We can get into there and start doing work now. Whereas if you've got them all together, the one part might be drier and you think, well, I can get in there and start working that bit of the field now. And then the other ones will have um, been lying wetter for longer. And you, you're, you're in the danger then of changing the structure of the soils. So essentially the work that I do, I'm a, uh, by nature of my role, I'm a farm advisor. So essentially what I'm attempting to do uh, through my day to day work in one way or another is move 
the landscape to look much less like it does on the left and much more like it does towards the right. I know there's a lot of different things on this. This um, image that shows you the difference in the way you can manage a landscape. You've got excess runoff causing little rills and gullies coming down through that field. You've got obviously um, silage heaps close to the water. You've got animals in and out of the water. You've got um, leaky slurry stores going into the water. And on this side, there's buffers between the water and the farm itself. Um, there's a lot more hedgerows. The management is different. They, they're plowing along with the with the contour here instead of up and down like you see here with the maze right next to the river. And there's lots of little things. And the, the thing is, there's not one single thing that changes a farm from being a good farm to another farm. They say because farming itself is a very complicated um, uh, job to have really in the respect of there's so many things that you need to be skilled in to actually be a, a good farmer and a lot of people underestimate that when they look at farmers they think it's quite a generic simplistic thing that you can do and it's it's so so much more than that but at the same time you're, you're held to account by two things the weather and the markets and essentially when you've got a lot of variables that you don't have any control over you start to make sure that you you control the variables you do have and sometimes that can make bad decisions and sometimes it makes good decisions that's why we are trying to um, give information over to the farming community to make this option much more economically viable than some people perceive it to be and this one to be unviable. So you've got soils are at the heart of everything within farming and what I've got here is this is a really good structured soil with nice deep roots going down and you can see there's water running down between between those roots and between the in and out of the, the soil um, aggregates but when it's functioning it functions well and when it isn't functioning you end up with situations like this now soils have an inherent capability and the different soils will have different abilities to absorb or repel water now a lot of the things that are going on in the landscape at the moment you've got to be careful that you don't put all your eggs into one basket and say well if if we're getting flooding like this it's because of the soils or the land management as we see it as, as it is now We've always had flooding and it's a natural thing to have within a landscape. But the thing is, it's the occurrence and the timings of those floodings that can change. And if that's to do with weather patterns and inverted commas, climate change with um, the, the um, frequency of these issues, that's a different thing. But we've also changed the landscape ourselves in, in a very large way with, the, with the, the amount of tarmac and stuff like that that we've also put over the landscape with housing developments and car parks and industrial estates and everything else. So when we try and compare and contrast whether it floods more now than it did in say 1930s or 40s or something like that, we've got to understand it's not just the farming that's changed, quite a lot of the other stuff has changed as well. But bring it all back to farming and bring it back to the work that I do, farming is still the predominant land use and therefore we're in a position there where we can have a significant change on that. Unfortunately, about 40% of the land uh, of the soils in the East Devon area, I know because this is one of the areas that have been studied quite heavily, they are degraded and when you get a degraded soil it just means that that soil isn't going to function hydrologically as well as it should. But you've also got to remember the variation of the soils means that a, a, a good soil in good condition, if it's inherently unable to absorb much water, it will run anyway, whereas a good soil that can absorb a huge amount of water, if it's not behaving well, will repel water quite quickly when we've lost the whole potential of that. You could have two, three hundred mils of rain on some of these soils and they should never run. And if they are running, then there's something significantly wrong with those. And I'll go into that as we work our way through. So if you look at this soil here, this is again, this is a grassland soil. This is a, this is a bit drier, so you can actually see what's going on a little bit, hopefully. But as a rule of thumb, Soils should be, if you've got a pie chart of soils, just under 50% of that, sort of 45% of it, will be the mineral fraction of that, which is made up of the sand, silt, and the clay content of that soil. And then you'll have somewhere like 5% of that soil then will be the organic matter. And then the remaining 50% will be made up of 25% to be air in that soil, and the other 25% will be the water that's in that soil. So that's a rough idea of what a good well-functioning soil should look like. Now that's obviously changes massively if you go up onto parts of Dartmoor, Exmoor and stuff like that. The organic matter of the peat soils up there is miles, miles higher than that. Peat soils 
come in at around 25% of organic matter and above. And obviously, but most soils in the East Devon are not like that, but they are, but they are equally valid as soil types. But what you have then is lots and lots of pores, which is where you have in the in between the rainfall events, these poles and these air spaces are going to be uh, air spaces that are going to get taken up and filled with water. And these poles and the air spaces are built by <coughs> the soil aggregating together into lovely, uh, crumbly, friable structure. And that is um, enhanced by the microbiology that happens within that, within the soils and the macrobiology as well, because you get the the functioning of the soil is dictated by the functioning of the plants. And, and vice versa, it's a symbiotic relationship. So when you have um, plants growing on the surface, most plants, and this is again a massive rule of thumb, but if you think about photosynthesis that's going on, about 25 to 30 percent of the energy that the plants are capturing from the sun, they put them back out through their roots as exudates, which are then feeding the biology. But the reason they're doing that is that feeds the fungi, the bacteria, all in the soils and then by feeding them and when they go through their um, life processes they turn what's previously unavailable to the plant nutrient wise into available nutrients for example a, um, a worm will new when it ingests a piece of uh, soil or, and organic matter within the soil process when it comes back out the other end of the worm it's got between uh, six and seven times more uh, potash available for a plant for example so it's 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 basically a functioning system. It's an ecosystem within itself, but because of the fact that it's generally covered by some vegetation, a lot of people just don't appreciate that it exists. And it's really important that we do appreciate it exists because obviously we as a, as, a, as humans uh, massively rely upon it. And there's there's a quite a famous quote that talks along the fact that um, humanity depends on six inches of rain uh, of soil and the fact that it rains. So essentially that's where we are with soils but we still don't take them that seriously. It's getting much better and it's going up the agendas of most governments and stuff like that now, which is great. And we've got the COP21 happening in Glasgow this year. And I'm sure souls will be front and centre again there, much as they were in Paris. But we, we really do need to get them functioning because they're not just functioning for the purpose of growing food. They're functioning for controlling climates. They're functioning for sequestering carbon so they can be one of the main methods of helping us mitigate climate change. They've just they, they've got huge amounts of potential. We just need to manage them a little bit better. So, so you've gone from a basically lovely lots of poles sort of soil like that, and then you go into a, um, a soil pit like this. And you can see that the fact if I can get my cursor going, this is where you've got the subsoil starts. This is essentially sand. And then this is a very sandy loam over the top of that or well, loamy sand in this case. Loamy sand means it's more sandy. Sandy loam means it's a bit more loamy. But essentially, this is not a very good functioning soil at all, despite the fact that it's very sandy. It's capping at the surface, and there's very little water going to be infiltrating down through that and then going into the aquifer down below. Now, there's two problems with that. One, the aquifer isn't being replenished, but the second and uh, the first and more important one to in the short term is the fact that any water that isn't going in is going to run off. And as soon as it starts to run off, it will then start entering the water system um, at the surface much quicker than it should. And if it does that, then the risk of flooding increases um, disproportionately. So we need to change soils from dysfunctioning soils into functioning soils. And once we've got up to a point where the, the majority of the soils are functioning, any flooding event after that, is obviously nothing that we can attribute back to the soils. It's just going to be a natural event that we can um, that we have other means of trying to control the flows. Then, but until we get the soils in order, we a lot of stuff that we're likely to do isn't going to have as big an impact because the, just by sheer area and volume that they can hold, the soils are by far and away the most important part of um, natural flood management. So. When you've got a functioning soil, I'm going to hopefully this will work. And I'm, I'm always um, a bit trepidatious about using videos in um, PowerPoint. But when you get a functioning soil that's working, the water comes down. And in some soils, as I just showed you with those sand, uh, sandstone soils, the water will go down and then go down into a large aquifer. And then uh, that's brilliant. And it replenishes the aquifer. And then those aquifers then feed the rivers through the dry periods and everything else. And then in other parts of the landscape, you'll have um, 
soils where they'll function for the top sort of 30, 40 centimetres, sometimes less, sometimes more, but then they will hit an impermeable layer below. Now that layer of 40 centimetres can easily accept 40, 50 mils of rain if it's functioning quite well before it starts to fill up. So when you hear people talking about, oh, the soils are saturated, I'm a little bit dubious about that because it, they're not always necessarily saturated. They're just people are just seeing runoff and attributing it to the, the, the soils are good, but they're running when not often it's the soils aren't as good as they should be. So they're not accepting them as much water. But when you've got the water coming down, and I'm hoping this video will explain it better, but just so you go context, it should go down, hit the layer, and then naturally run off. And runoff is stuff that happens below the ground. Surface runoff is what happens at the surface. So when you hear the term runoff, it, it should mean the stuff that's happening underground. Now, hopefully this video will show you this happening in the landscape when I was doing another project. So we're looking down, straight down into the hole. So this is your, the walls of the hole and the water is running just from this layer. So it's, it's, it's basically percolated down through the soils above this point. And then it's hit the impermeable clay layer below or semi-permeable, so it's impeded drainage. And then it's just running out. So I'll play that again quickly. So that's where all of the water is coming through. And this happens naturally in the landscape. And that's great. And this can be farmers many years ago would have done quite a lot of this where and to a certain extent they still do it, where they put in drains at this depth or below this depth to accelerate that as well. And in some ways that can be actually quite good for flooding because of the fact that it creates extra capacity within the soil profile. But you've got to be careful you don't overdo it. So this is a sort of landscape that everybody likes to see and everybody thinks is functioning really well and to be honest with you that does look like it's not too bad but just because of the fact that there's a superficial look to it it doesn't necessarily mean that all of the soils there are functioning as well as they should and it's really important that we understand that society wise but also that obviously the people who are actually dealing with that land understand it and um, my job is often I describe it as a bit like I don't play golf very often but when I do play golf we spend most of the time hating it and then at the very end you realise that you've actually done a couple of things right and it's worth doing again. My job is much like that in the respect that I think I'm banging my head against a brick wall quite a lot of the time and then you make light bulb moments happen and you can see changes in land use and you can see changes in land management and then you can see the, the landscape function much better and you're thinking well I'll carry on doing this, it seems to be working. And it's really important that we don't lose perspective and get overwhelmed by the size of the problem sometimes because this is something that society is pushing towards and we are getting there slowly. What you find, and this is something, this is a, an example of it in East Dev, um, Mid Devon, sorry. When you come across water running like this, you can see a huge amount of soil um, sitting in that water, it's very turbid. My natural the reaction now, I can't cross a river without looking to see what the state of the river is. And when I'm obviously out on the roads and stuff like that, when I see something like this, my natural reaction is to investigate, well, where's all that coming from? The first thing you do is obviously take a couple of photos. And I, it's a bit difficult to see on here, but I don't know whether this is the same place with the same rainfall, but the water running down on this side of the road is very clear. And that's just basically what's landed on the road. So that's not representative, but it's it's fairly representative. On this side, you've got all of this turbidity. So all the suspended sediment that's in the water course. And this was essentially coming from a maize field, which is obviously not the ideal um, thing to have in this part of the landscape because of the fact that the way they were managing it obviously wasn't working because of all of the, they were losing their soil. And over time, obviously, they'll lose their field and eventually they'll lose the productivity out of that field and then they'll struggle to make it work. So it's not what we're doing is asking them to change their practices so much that it inhibits them. We're trying to make it more sustainable for the longer term. This isn't the maize field, but this was the same year. And this is an example of where um, the forager went in to get the maize out. Basically, that big hole in the middle there that filled up the water was where it got stuck and sunk because of the fact that the conditions were just not good, not suitable for maize harvest at, at all. But the maize by its nature um, is quite late harvesting if the farmers haven't got it right and got the maize in early enough. I've got nothing against maize. I actually quite like maize as a crop. And the problem I have with maize is when it's grown in the wrong places at the wrong time. And that really annoys me. So you end up with, this is that field, you end up with situations like this with this huge amount of rutting going on as the tractors and trailers are just trying to get the crop off. Then they end up coming, they have to get out onto their own system at some point generally, unless they're, they're lucky enough to be contained within, wholly within their farm. 
But a little thing for, to point out here is there's a little hole in the in the tracking here that you can see. Essentially, the river runs just underneath the track there, and this was holding so much water because of the size of the the ruts that they burst a hole in that, and all of the water then essentially just ran straight into the stream and smothered the stream. So it's <clears throat> it's not ideal practice whatsoever. The environment agency and others were made aware of this. And I went out to investigate it. I was I was told about it as well, so I went out to investigate, and this, these are obviously the results of that. But it's just a, a this is an example of soils not functioning well because of mismanagement of the timings and stuff like that. But there's more than just maize; it's mistimings of when you actually start to look at your uh, silage harvesting, when you're looking at establishing new grass lays. There's, Every single thing you do within farming comes with a risk, and it's just a matter of managing that risk in a in a more holistic, long-term uh, vision, really. And when it goes really wrong, that's me from my better side. It goes really wrong, and this is exactly what you don't want to see in a landscape because that soil that's gone from that bit has to be replaced at some point. It, from a farmer's point of view, it cost him a lot of money to get all of the, but well, he won't have got all of the soil left back. We will have to import soil and then re-landscape that to get it back into a field that's actually functioning again. So it's it's not a sort of thing you do lightly, but this is a classic light soil that's um, just eroded really, really badly. And then this is the result when you see it, when it starts to hit the watercourses and you end up with huge amounts of deposits of uh, sediment into the watercourse. And these soils then become, whereas previously they were a massive asset, once they've lost from the farm, they've lost an asset, but the, the environment has gained a pollution. And these soils smother gravels, as you probably well know, and they inhibit um, uh, plant growth and they, um, they inhibit the productivity of the spawning gravels, but they also then are in a position where they bring with them associated uh, chemicals and nutrients that they, uh, phosphate, for example, sticks to the side of the soil particle and when that gets then into the water course you then end up in a situation where you get really high algal glooms and phosphate and eutrophication takes off so it's a it's a bit of a problem but these are just three quick profiles to show you just differences this is differences in soils within um well there's, there's more than just these but just to show you when you get down into the lower end of a catchment um this is not the river otter but this would be a classic example of a river otter catchment where you get into the gravel, the historic gravel beds of rivers going back many, many years. And then on top of that, you're getting the, the light sandy soils that are deposited on the top. This is a really good functioning soil or has the ability to be if it's well managed. The problem with these soils is the fact that they've, they're known as leaky in the respect of they leach quite easily. So any um, nutrients and stuff like that you apply to these soils, if those nutrients are likely to go into solutions such as nitrogen and stuff like that, they'll leak through this system really quite quickly unless they're captured by the plant. So any time that you haven't got a plant growing, any nutrients in there have the susceptibility then to be dropped down through the soil profile. It still remains really, really um, porous all the way down through this point. So you can accept vast quantities of water. In this one, then you're into the, uh, the more classic brown earth where you're going to get a bit of clay a bit further down lovely clay loam above and then um, a nice humid layer at the top then with uh, where you've got your grass growing. And then these are your slightly heavier soils over here where you've got um, the, the obvious subsoil lying down the horizon through there and it's grey down below and I'll talk about that in a second. And then you've got a lighter um, brown orange coloured clay above and then you've got your really, really dark peaty soils at the top. Now the dark peaty soils kick in when the and this is why you get obviously peatlands up on Dartmoor and Exmoor and Bodmin. When, when what's happening there is the fact that by the nature of the topography and and the, what grows there, when things die, they break down really quite slowly because of the fact that the conditions that they're in are more often than not anaerobic. So they break down much more slowly than they would in a light sandy soil like this, which is very aerobic, which means that the the, while, uh, the, the microbiology in this soil can function really quite quickly, which means it struggles to hold on to organic matter. Whereas these over here, the microbiology can't work so fast. So it holds on to a lot of the carbon and everything else. So you end up with that really dark color and that's the carbon. But you've got that on top of a relatively, not free draining, but that's a, a permeable topsoil. And then you can see this distinct horizon. 
And where it goes grey down below that horizon, this is what's known as a glay soil. I won't go into too much detail about these kind of things, but essentially when you've got a rising and falling water table, at the maximum general extent of that water table, it becomes anaerobic. And when things become anaerobic, there's an awful lot of um, aluminium and um, iron in our soils. And when things go anaerobic, anything that's in there tries to take the um, oxygen because it can't take it out of the water. It takes it out of the, the soil. So then for instead of going um, ferric, as in like rust on um, a piece of iron, it goes ferrous, which then makes it, it bleaches the soil. And that's where you get glazed oils when they're laying anaerobic for long periods of time. So it's one of those things that you can do. You can have that in a in a natural functioning soil, but sometimes if you cause compaction further up the soil profile, the soil above it can go grey as well. And that's not natural formed um, glazed soils. That's a that's a form of land management. And if you solve the problem of that um, impediment, so the flow, the water, uh, the soil keeps its natural hydrology. Is then able to allow the water through with that you get the ear and then it starts to function again and the color comes back but at the time you're doing this on a constant basis naturally then you're obviously into a problem of um where they go glay but that's natural so when you have that come back to that video i showed you earlier you can have the water will percolate down to the ear and then reach that horizon and because it's full of water already the water will just have to run off down down the slope and into it might come out into a spring or it might just come out into the river at some point or a stream that's feeding into the river. So it all depends on whether there's been extra drainage put in or just uh, field ditches or whatever. The lighter soils when they go wrong, they because they haven't got much organic matter as we were just talking about, they, they tend to be quite vulnerable. And if you've got no cropping over the top, you end up being in a position then where they can actually um, be impacted quite badly by heavy rainfall. This is a classic example where the rainfall has been so heavy that it there's those aggregates, those beautiful aggregates I've telling you that when you haven't got the, um, um, the biology in there holding it all together, there's a substance called glomalin, which I might talk about later. When that raindrop comes down, it hits the, the sand silt and the clay content and it shatters it all apart. And then they settle out and it's that settling out that causes these caps. This is a bit of an extreme cap and you can see it on bare soils quite quickly after most rainfall, but lighter soils are more susceptible to it than um, the heavier soils and the higher clay content soils. And basically water then comes down, hits the top of this cap and runs off instead of percolating down through the soil profile. But also you get the seedlings and, and that can't get up through the capping if it comes too quickly. In this case, you've got one coming out and others that are just going to go up. And you often see them just running sideways underneath, which is a bit disappointing for the seed, obviously, and they run out of energy before they've actually managed to get to the to the surface. All that leads to similar problems that I've just shown you photos of before, which is obviously something that we have to deal with. But going back to what I was just saying then about glomalin, this is a, a, a really good experiment that was done by um, a guy called Chris Watts at Roth Rothamsted University uh, through um, Cranfield, sorry, but uh, it was at Rothamsted that he was doing it. And you've got grassland here with the soil organic carbon is 30 grams per kilogram and then you've got soil organic carbon in a, a long-term arable that's only got half the amount of carbon and it's that carbon that feeds the microbiology and the microbiology then in their actions of doing that and the fungi and everything else they create a substances like glomalin when i used to call it when i was presenting this to to the kids they call it the prit stick of soils where it just glues all of the soil particles together so you get those nice little aggregates of soil and when you get the aggregates of soil sticking together and then they go back against each other, there's lots of space around them. If you haven't got that, they become compact and then they, they don't have the same porosity, but they also don't have the strength. And hopefully this will work and you'll be able to see what I mean by they don't have the strength. This isn't sped up, by the way. So essentially these two um, aggregates of soil were just air dried so they're just taken out of the soil, put on the side, let to dry naturally over a, a day or two. And what happens there is the fact that when the water is rushing back in to fill the voids that were um, left behind by the air and, and the water that had dried out from there, because there was no structural integrity to the, what, the arable soil because of the lack of carbon <coughs> and the organic matter, essentially when that water rushed in, it burst the whole thing apart. Whereas in the, um, the grassland soil, the water still rushes in but it's got that much more cohesive um, 
strength that it actually just stays together. So if you imagine the soil on the right being hit by lots of heavy raindrops and the one on the left, you can see how different they can be. So again, going back, this is the sort of landscape that we all want to see, and this is what we're actually looking at, but we can't expect to have that landscape looking like that all of the time and functioning really well. Be below all of that, the soil is going to be behaving sometimes naturally and sometimes not, and we just need to make sure that as much of that landscape is behaving as um, well as we can. Now, Lydia, how are we looking for time? Well, we've got we've got until 12, but if we can have a bit of time for questions, that'd be good. All right, well, I'll, I'll just quickly do this last little bit then. Yeah, uh, because this is just a, hopefully a nice segue of showing you the multi functioning nature of soils in the respect of um, what you can see in front of you here. Again, this is East Devon. Um, you've got Bicton down this bottom end here um, where I had that. Uh, uh, Google photo earlier, uh, a satellite image. Essentially, the little red dots are boreholes and the uh, the red dots themselves are actually what's known as source protection zones. And these are all around boreholes to protect them. And these are government, uh, these are private uh, boreholes for our water supply through Southwest Water. But the green ones are the, the next source protection zones. So in the red ones, anything that you do at the surface is likely to get into the borehole within sort of 50 days. Anything then in the green zone can take anywhere between 50 days and 400 days. And then within the blue zone, it can take greater than 400 days, but still has the good opportunity of getting to the borehole. Now, the reason that I brought this up is the fact that obviously this covers quite a large area of the landscape. And when you're looking to work with the farmers and others in the landscape to get them to change their management, you have to contextualize it into a way that what they're doing has a greater impact. And one of the things that um, my my roles is to actually look at this. Um, I get all of the data from Southwest Water and one of the reasons upstream thinking started was the nitrate levels in the boreholes was going up and it's a bit like the classic churning a super tanker. You have to do things in advance of it getting to be a, a problem. Otherwise, the time it takes for the system to react can be longer and therefore you'll end up getting yourself into a big problem further down the line. So. I've been out working with the farmers to try and reduce the amount of nitrate lost into these boreholes by the amount of nitrate that they're either applying or applying badly or applying at the wrong time or just they didn't need to apply it in the first place. So through all of that work, I was carrying out nitrogen sampling of the soils before winter and after winter and then with a little bit of um, uh, working out what was likely to have been taken up by the growing crop if there was a growing crop in that field at that time. I was then be able to calculate the amount of losses of nitrogen from the fields. And hopefully, and this is basically the, the the six or seven seven years I was doing it for Southwest Water. And as you can see in the first year, we were losing somewhere in the, this is an average across 10 farms. We were losing on average about 65 kilos of nitrogen per hectare. And then if you're looking up here now in, this is 2017, um, the, those losses had come down to a more manageable 11, 12 uh, kilos of N. Now, it's almost impossible to apply nitrogen without losing some. And the government guidance explains that, and it ex also explains the fact that you're likely to lose somewhere between 40 and 30 percent, really, generally. And I've been working with the farmers to make sure that those losses are actually much further towards zero. And we've done quite a lot of good work on that. And once you give the farmers the information and the understanding of what they come up with some really innovative ideas and they come up with solutions and it's, it's really good then when you see now in practice but one of the things you've got to understand with nitrogen is it's it really is quite vulnerable to being lost so you, it's applying it as and when it's needed in small doses and then just keep reapplying but you've got to get, be careful that you don't over um, complicate things by having some of their costs now this was picked in college who kindly said that um, we'd be happy to have me do some work with them and this is one of those fields and to give you an indication they were losing let's say 100 what's that 150 ish 155 maybe kilos of n in the first year and then after conversations and changes in practice we got them up then so they were losing somewhere in the region of about 20 kilos of n and they, I'm, i've used this slide very often at the moment more because of the fact that it shows you how everything that you do is linked to the relationships that you have with everyone 
at this stage, the farm manager left to go off to another job. The new farm manager came in and he didn't really want to engage in the process that much. So he carried on, but he still let me take the figures. He then saw that the losses had gone up hugely. So he was then, well, I need to sort that out. So he started talking to me again and then it came back up to being there. And then we remained relative. We've gone through a couple of other farm managers since then, but they've kindly been part of the process. And we've ended up in 2017 with, and I think it's still the current manager is there now. I, really weirdly, the results actually ended up at naught. I mean, they could have ended up at five. They could have ended up at 25 below, but they actually ended up dead on naught, which was a little bit weird when I saw that through my calculations, but that's the nature of it. But yeah, so that just shows you that it's it's about relationships and it's about working with people and giving them good data so they can make educated decisions. And this one is an organic farmer. And the reason I'm bringing this up is organic farmer is often seen as the panacea to everything and it'll solve all these problems. When it comes to things like nitrogen, because of the being um, organic, they can't apply nitrogen from a bag, but they can apply it through um, manures and stuff like that, or they have to grow leguminous plants to fix as much nitrogen as they can to sustain the following crops. And this is one of the dangers, as you can see, that in the first year, they actually gained in that first year when I was taking the samples, a huge amount of nitrogen. They were, well, they're huge, but about 25 to 30 kilos of N they were gaining throughout that soil profile. But in the following year, they created an awful lot of nitrogen that they couldn't use, and then it just got washed out of the system. So they suddenly made huge losses, and then they came back up and then were uh, like around just below zero for their losses. So this is this graph has been really useful with the, a lot of the organic farmers I'm working with, and it'd be great to try this data again now to see how much we brought this loss up because of the fact that they're changing the timing of their operations. And it's, it's the sort of thing you have to do over a long period of time because this was reasonably wet, but it wasn't horrific. If they'd done this change, somewhere around 2012, 13 or 2013, 14, when we had two exceptionally wet winters, I imagine those losses would have been significantly higher. But these things um, are one of the things that we've now finally got in the ground, um, and these are going to be great if we can hopefully find enough money and people to actually uh, look at these. These are what's called porous pots, and you, you push these into the ground using a, an auger and you get them down to about 90 centimetres. So it's below the roots of a lot of the cropping and anything that this basically is under vacuum and it absorbs groundwater that has got past all of the crop roots. And then through these pipes, you can pull out the, the water that's got in there and sample it. And this is a brilliant mechanism of giving data back to water companies and back to the farmers to tell them how much they've lost. And if you can actually give them real figures in real time to say how much is being lost out of their field over the course of the two weeks and then the course of all of the winter, if you're able to monitor regularly enough, it just means you're in a brilliant position then to really um, accelerate land use change and all the rest of it when they realise that this costing them quite a lot of money and they're putting, well, what they're putting on isn't actually going on into the crop, it's, it's leaving the system. So I'll just leave you with a couple of other soil facts just to quickly round things up. Essentially, as a quarter of the world's biodiversity is in soils, most people didn't realise that or don't realise that. And it's essentially that's why we need to make sure they get keep front and centre. You've got 95% of our food comes from soils, so if we didn't, humanity wouldn't survive without them. So we really do need to protect them. It's the world's largest filter, world's largest tank. There's more water than the soils you can shake a stick at. Um, they supply the plants with the nutrients and the water and obviously give them the medium to grow in. And there's more carbon in the um, in the ground than there is in the vegetation above it. So our fascination with just growing as many trees as we possibly can to solve all the problems is, is fine. And I've got no problem with that, but as long as there's trees in the right place. But at the same time, we need to look at the other opportunities that we can do that are actually can function for both farming and for society. And we can actually make a bigger change probably much quicker as well, because obviously it takes a long time for many trees to grow, but we that's not the say don't put the trees in, but just make sure that we get um, the system moving as soon as we possibly can. And as Franklin D. Roosevelt said, a nation that destroys its soils destroys itself. And I think they said that back in, he said that back in the 40s, and it didn't stop the Americans still destroying plenty of their soils, but finally they're coming around to the idea it's not the idea. So that'll do, that was enough from me. So I'll share. Yeah, thank you, Yog. That's that's really interesting. 
Um, I learned a lot and I'm sure you all did too. I've um, got a few questions in the chat um, from Jan. I wonder, Jan, do you want to unmute and talk through your questions? Um, am I unmuted? Yes, nope. you are, Jan. Oh, yeah, 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 you are, yeah, I knew you, sorry. <laughs> okay, thank you very much, Jog. That was really fascinating. Um, I've got lots of questions, but here's just a few of them. Okay. Um, is there is there a map anywhere identifying degraded soils in in East Devon? You said forty percent were degraded. Yeah, no, the, um, that forty percent has come out of um, basically there was a study that was carried out by a gentleman called Richard Smith um, and Bob. Uh, God, I've forgotten Bob's second name now. It'll come to me, sorry. Um, but yeah, they've they've dug holes in, um, I think it's a couple of thousand fields across East Devon, and then they were um, assessing the state of the structure of those soils over that period of time. And yeah. then they were then able to say whether they were degraded or they were functioning well. And that's where that figure of there's degraded and then there's levels of degradation. So you can have mildly degraded and you can have severely degraded. Obviously that um, will completely influence the amount of rainfall they'll be able to accept and stuff like that. Um, but yeah, so they've there isn't a map of it. It's just a series of points that they've actually um, put into a, um, an academic paper which has been released. It's probably available to if you can find it. Um, and it's the uh, East Devon Souls. OK, thank you very, thank you very much. Um, you talked about the prit stick of soils and you said that the material that was secreted by organic or uh, by organisms was globulin or I can how do you spell it please? G L O globulin. Hang on, I'll have to spell it myself. Hang on. So it's G L O M A G L U I N. Globulin. glomalin. Essentially, glomalin is like I say, it's a product and it it ends up in like a little um secure sort of glue and fungi sort of mix around the soils and holds the, holds the aggregates together into bigger and bigger functions of the soil. Yes, I've read a paper by um, Professor Andy Neal, um, uh, who worked uh, from Roth Hampstead. Oh, okay. He's not actually at Roth Hampstead, but he, it, it was published by yeah. Roth, Roth Hampstead, where there's muck, there's brass, it's called. Yes, yeah, yeah. yeah. It's about this um, this sort this material i think yeah they, essentially what that, that's a really good point and I'll, I'll, I'll just quickly extend on that slightly the when when people uh when farmers and stuff like that go out and they're spreading their manures when you've got manures going back into the soil system it's that manure then that is accelerating the growth of those or um, maintaining the the life within the soil as well so it's not just the plant that's supplying the root uh, the um the photosynthesized energy back into the roots and stuff like that. It's all these other products that are coming in and all of that processing is what keeps the functioning healthy ecosystem. It's like everything. You can have lots of one thing, but that's no use. You need lots of everything or large equal balances of lots of other things to get a functioning system. And in East Anglia and places like that, where they've taken animals and stuff like that out of the system, they're having to replace all of these things that they've been lost from the uh, soils artificially and stuff like that and that's degrading the soils in a different way is they're beginning to lose their structure and their ability to grow crops because of the fact that the soils aren't they don't have the functioning biology that they should have down here we've, we're slightly the other way we're sometimes putting on too many nutrients and too much um, um, organic matter in some cases so we're building up nutrients to run a sort of problematic levels so it's a it's unfortunate disbalance between the, the different parts of the country in the respect if we could spread all of our manures evenly across all of the country, the soil would be much happier, but it's not cheap. You can't do that. So it's <laughs> it's just a function of where we are. Thank you. Um, what should a good soil profile look like on Mercia Mudstone? I mean, it, would there be a hard pan layer because of the iron um, in the soil or? Um, essentially, there's um, if you if you ever wanted to have a look at doing this, there's a there's a um, it's called VES. Um, which is comes out of the Scottish Rural University um, SURC or SCR, I can't remember which way around it is, but um, uh, essentially it's called VES, which is the Visual um, Evaluation of Soil Structure. And it, essentially what they've done is simplify soil 
an um, assessment down into a categorization of five different standards. And essentially, you look at the, the soil biology, you look at the soil structure and everything else and then what's going on the surface, and then you're able to assign it a score. And it, it's become pretty much industry standard used now for lots of things. And it's been really useful for me in the respect that I, I can dig holes and look at a soil and tell you that it's degraded. But if I were then to dig a hole on a different soil type somewhere else and tell you that one's degraded, you wouldn't necessarily then be able to say, well, which one was the more degraded than that one? So at least when you've got a metric that you can attribute it to, irrespective of soil type, you're then able to say, well, this one scored an SQ of two, this one scored an SQ of three. So that one's the, the higher that it starts at one is really good and five is really bad. And then it gives you methods of what you can actually do to mitigate that. Sometimes depending on what it is, you just leave it and it'll, it'll regenerate itself but it'll take a lot longer. Sometimes mechanical intervention can actually speed up that process or you can um, do other things that will actually make it you just like a, some, a simple thing, like a really hot, if, we, if this summer continues like the really hot weather we've had for the last few um, few days and weeks, continues for a while, the soils, the, some of the clay soils, for example, will really start to break apart and crack up. And that is a form of remediation of the soil degradation in itself, because then when they come back together, when the rains start, they'll actually they'll be reformed. We're, and you can say the same thing in a really cold winter, we'll have a frost heave that will lift all of the soil back up and then it'll lay it back down after being broken apart some of the compaction. But you'll get more soil heave in a, some compacted soils than you will in good soils because of the soil functioning. I mean, you hold less, you hold water in a good soil but you will have a lot of airspace for everything to expand into, whereas in a compacted soil, there's less airspace, so it blows it apart. Thank you. I'm um, sorry, I've taken up rather a lot of your time. Just one quick question. Is there a relationship between the amount of nitrate you would find in water and the amount of phosphates? Uh, you not, talked about concern with nitrates yeah, in yeah. water. Is yeah, phosphates also phosphate, an issue? It's, it's, Nitrate is a soluble nutrient, so it gets into the water courses quite quickly and quite easily. Whereas um, uh, phosphate isn't that mobile. It actually, like I said, it adsorbs to the side of the soil particles, so it sticks with the soil. So if the soil gets into the river, then the, the phosphate can go with the soil into the river. But at the same time, it's a quite a stable nutrient in the in the landscape, the phosphate. But if you keep applying phosphate to a field through manures and um, and out of a bag, if you reach sort of levels, and uh, I don't need to know what this necessarily means, but essentially there's indices of soil um, phosphate levels, and you get the same for potash and stuff like that. If you've got soils at around two, two and a, two, between two and three for phosphate, you're generally doing fine, and that's great for crop growth and everything else. As soon as you start going above fives, well, late fours and fives, you're then into a position where that phosphate becomes vulnerable to going into solution because it's saturated so much. Once it's in saturation, it's transfer then into the water course can be much quicker and then yes, it becomes a problem. But whereas nitrogen, when it's applied, it can go straight into the water course if there's nothing there to collect it and, and there's a sufficient amount of rainfall to break it down and take it into solution. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thanks, Jan. Um, OK, so we've got Trevor and Neil. So Trevor, if you go next, then we'll have Neil. Right, thank you. Can you hear me? Yeah. yeah. OK, I've, I've got two questions for you. I'd, I'd like to know what the crop requirement regarding cattle slurry is for growing maize. And I'll just give you a, a quick figure uh, on a seven acre field quite close to our house. On the 15th of March, we had uh, 15 slurry tankers of uh, Sherborne 3200. So about 45,000 gallons of slurry was spread on seven acres. Um, two weeks after that, the whole field was spread with solid manure. And there were about 30 separate muck spreadings come in um, to cover the field. And on the... Uh, 15th of March, there was a further 45,000 gallons of liquid slurry spread on top of that. Uh, bearing in mind, it should be incorporated as soon as practical. Um, this was left on a bare field for five weeks. Um, I got my suspicions that the farmers around here, this is just one example, are using it as a repository 
for their slurry that uh, they can't get rid of in any other way. I think DEFRA says that you should have about four and a half thousand gallons per acre spread. Um, could I have your comments on that regarding maize? This is spread on a crop that was harvested um, in October last year and um, really it was left as a complete mud and slurry bath until um, uh, 23rd of April when it was tilled this year. Um, right, well that's uh, unfortunately not massively unusual. Um, those levels are very high, but the, the difficulty is when you're seeing what's going on, you're not going to know exactly what the nutrient content of that is because of the fact that um, unless it's been tested and you can you can get to see the analysis, which is one of the things I do do with the farmers, I test their slurries and um, an FYM manures for them, the solid fractions. Um, you're never going to know what fully what the actual nutrient content is. Um, for to give you a rough rule of thumb, the the nitrogen required for a, on a a medium soil is around 100 to 120 kilos of N per hectare. Um, the good thing about nitrogen in the respect from a nitrogen point of um, a good thing about maize from a nitrogen point of view, I should say, is the fact that it, it continues to take up nitrogen most of the way through the summer. Whereas if you look at sort of a, a winter cereal crop, obviously it'll start to senesce as, as you can see out in the fields at the moment. They're all beginning to um, senesce and therefore they're not taking up any nitrogen. So any nitrogen that's left in the system now, if we were to get uh, enough rainfall to see it travel through the soil profile, then we would lose some of that nitrogen, but that's unlikely at this time because a lot of the rain that comes down goes back up. Uh, it, doesn't, it sits in the soil and then evaporates back up. But um, it, what you were saying there isn't unusual in the respect that they do use it as suppositories to dump manures. And the farming rules for water exist at the moment where you're only supposed to apply manures at the rate that the actual growing crop requires. So what tends to happen, and historically is what's happened, is the fields really close to the barns will be really high in phosphate values because of the fact that it's the closest place to dump the manures and that's what they've done. But then as we've me um, mechanised agriculture, the maize fields tended to be pushed to the outside of the farm. So the, the, the fields furthest away from the farm, just so they can keep the, the closer fields for grazing and uh, other things like silaging, because they'd be doing that once or twice or even three times a year. And then the maize that they'd only grow to it um, dump the manures and then they grow the crop and then they want to grow back out to it once to harvest that crop. So that tends to be the case that they do do that and they are used as a, um, a repository for their manures, but that isn't right. It's right if you're applying it at the right levels, but if you're if you're applying it at those levels, that's probably far too much. OK, oh, just one further question. And again, I'm sorry for hogging the question a bit. <laughs> um, a, a, a different farmer, a, a same theme, um, uh, bearing in mind that West Sedgemoor, I, uh, we're on West Sedgemoor, the RSPB land. Yeah. Uh, I don't know if you're familiar with the area at all. Reasonably, uh, but not, not brilliantly. That's good. The part of West Sedgemoor we're talking about is a triple SI um, and a Ramsar site. Um, and the farmer in question put uh, approximately looking at the big trailers again these were big sherborns um about 150 tons of slurry sand from from their bedding spread over the fields down on the ramsar site itself um this this is the same level as the ditches and the reens as we call them down here um and on top of that there was probably um about another 100 200 thousand gallons of slurry went on top of that as well um they've since been stopped from doing that which is brilliant um and a, a bit of a result there what i'm saying is that this is also happening on stanmore which is the other side um we've recorded levels of 500 parts per billion on west sedgemoor of phosphate um, in the water <coughs> on Sedgemore Old Reen and levels from my colleague of 500 parts per billion has also been recorded uh, from the Reen on Stanmore. Now 
West Edgemore here is a triple SI and a Ramsar, as I said. Um, over the other side, you've got Curry Moor, which is also a Ramsar site. And on the other side of River Parrot is Grey Lake, which is a triple SI. Now, Stanmore sits in the middle of all these three and has no designation. How difficult is it for an organisation such as yourself and uh, the all the more pro professional bodies to get it designated as a triple SI? Uh, I'm assuming that the floor is much the same. Obviously, the fauna is not the same. There aren't as many uh, thousands of waders coming in on uh, Stanmore, which is undesignated, as there are on our other three moors which surround it. But it is a bit of a hole in the middle. Yeah. Um, just going back to one thing you said earlier, and, and I, I didn't address it when you mentioned it, because you talked about the fact that those manures weren't incorporated. Um, yeah. The fact that they weren't incorporated is an issue, um, especially um, one of the government's big um, pushes at the moment is for ammonia losses. And if they're not um, incorporated quickly, then the amount of nitrogen loss through ammonia loss through into the volatilization into the atmosphere is quite large. And also it means that this its proximity to triple SIs and stuff like that will have an adverse effect. So it's not just the um, loss of nitrogen from the farming point of view, it's the loss of nitrogen then going into and forming into triple SIs, which has an adverse effect on the, the makeup of the plants in those in those areas. So that's one thing you think. When it comes to the designation of a um, a triple SI, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, somebody else from WRT, but as far as I'm aware, um, that's a natural England issue. And they would they would be the only ones who are able to designate that sort of thing. They will have to go through um, their own process to actually assess whether it's sort of um, sufficient value from obviously a scientific point of view that they've actually then give it that designation. But that's, we, you could, um, lobby for it to be and all that sort of stuff and if there's sufficient evidence then they may well do that but as far as I'm aware it has to be the um, natural England you have to approach to do that. Thank you, thank you very much. That's it. Uh, that wasn't a slopey shoulders answer, that's, li that's literally... <laughs> <laughs> it doesn't help me much at all but thank you <laughs> very very much. Thanks, thanks Trevor and thanks Yog. Just one, we'll just go to, to Neil now. Thank you. Can you hear me? Yep. 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 Great. Yep. Hi. Uh, thank you for a good talk, first of all. Um, at the start of it, you mentioned uh, uh, boundaries and soil changes were often where boundaries were. Yep. Where you've got the boundaries coming down to the river, um, what effect will that have on the water and the invertebrate and then obviously the fish in that river where there are those changes? Uh, well, it, it, those changes generally won't have, um, if you think about everything behaving naturally and functioning well, those changes won't have any adverse effect necessarily on um, on the river itself. The difficulty comes is when, when people start to yeah. treat different soil types exactly the same because they'll have four or five fields with one or two or three different soil types and then think, well, that's, that blocks my grassland thing and then they'll go in and they'll take silage off it at, all in one block. And the timing might not be right for one soil type in comparison with another. The, the 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 way it impacts on the on the river if it's not functioning very well is the fact that if you're going into like I say going back to that theoretical block of land, parts of it may have dried out sufficiently that will actually mean that the soil the soil has a massively high shear strength when it's when it's dry and sufficiently dry, and it loses its plasticity. So therefore, it's able to take the weight of the tractors and the trailers and everything else. That's that's relatively fine. But as soon as you've got enough moisture in there and sufficient clay content as well, it, it just collapses and it becomes squashed. And it's at that point then you start to have the issues that can be associated with excess runoff. And then it's that runoff then it doesn't have to take soil. It can take chemicals or whatever from if there are any chemicals put onto that field or bag fertilizers. And then they will take them into the water courses quite quickly. And it's that's where you get the detrimental effects of soil types not being managed to what the soil uh, the soil's natural inherent ability is and it's just that squaring that circle with the farmer in the respect of they have to change their system to only apply only look at that field at a certain time now if you think think it's relatively straightforward to do things like that 
The difficulty now is the fact that the cost of machinery and everything else is prohibitively expensive for a lot of farmers. So they tend to give their ground out, um, or give their ground, they, they tend to have their ground managed by contractors who have the bigger, better um, machinery and stuff like that. But the, the, the contractor may turn up, I mean, we've had some lovely weather, but I don't know whether you can remember, there was that um, terrible Sunday where we had huge amounts of rain a couple of weeks back. Now, if you had a contractor said, well, I can turn up tomorrow and cut all your grass. And then you'd have, to, if you were silage, you need to wait a few days and then you'd, you'd insile it or hey, you'd have to wait a lot longer. Or he says, I can come back in three weeks. You're as a farmer then, if you're not sufficiently high up the peck in order within that contractor or you haven't got enough push with the contractors, you're going to have to make a decision on whether, well, the, the grass is ready to be cut, but the soil underneath hasn't had a chance to dry out. And you have to make that weighing up of the risk of yeah. whether you go with the contractor now or whether you go within, you wait three weeks and in three weeks, if you have dry weather like this, that grass will have bolted even more then and it's gone into seed and everything else and you've lost some of the quality of it. Still got a good crop of something, but it's, it's just not, you've lost that opportunity. And it's it's weighing up those risks that can sometimes be a bit of an issue within the farming community when you don't have enough sway with the contractors or there just isn't enough contractors. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, I'd say I'll, over to you, Lydia. Thanks. <laughs> Neil, thank you. Uh, we have reached 12 o'clock, but Andrew, if you've got a really good quick question, we can fit it in. I have. Thank you, Didier. Uh, Jörg, thanks. Lovely talk. Just quickly, you mentioned that uh, that, that nitrogen uh, um, uh, fertilizers losses about 30 to 40 percent. Is that on flat land or is that on uh, on on very, very steep inclinations? No, that's um, the, the, it's one of the things that a lot of people um, if you come back to, like I said, about um, a naturally functioning soil. If you've got a naturally functioning soil, the slope shouldn't play too great a part in it. If you, in most rainfall events, if, if the soil's functioning and it's, a, and it's a soil that's actually able to accept rainfall, as in like a lot of rainfall, it still shouldn't run despite of the slope. I know it sounds counterintuitive. If you think that obviously the natural thing is pulling it down the slope and everything else, but because of the nature of soils and the way that they um, act as sponges, they can actually absorb that water quickly and it shouldn't do overland flow so much. I mean, yes, you do get some, don't get me wrong, it's not as if it doesn't go overland, but it, it shouldn't, that shouldn't be the case. With regard to nitrogen, that's then a function of the soil's condition and the, the amount you've applied and everything else and how you've applied it. If you've applied the nitrogen through, um, for example, through uh, slurries, they're quite wet and they will just get absorbed in quite quickly and then your losses then were likely to be less. Whereas if you applied it as a prill fertilizer, so it's an artificial bag fertilizer, you put it on and then it does rain. If the soils aren't functioning, it will wash it all down the bottom. So you do see, if you look at, I mean, unfortunately, I can't look at the landscape very well now. Every time I look at the landscape, I'm picking out flaws. <laughs> I'm constantly just looking at the negatives instead of looking at the beauty of the bigger picture. But when you, if you look at, um, um, a winter cereal crop, for example, after the winter, when you start getting that first flush of growth, you will see that any seeds that have been shifted during that early part of the um, the, the autumn, you'll see excess plants at the bottom of the slope then you shouldn't, that should be evenly spread up the slope. You see that quite a lot. That area then will probably lodge a bit, which is when you have the, the crop will start to collapse. And you get a similar thing that happens then, even if the crop is relatively uniform and they apply fertilizers and then they shift, you will get excess growth at the end of the bottom of the slopes because you know that the nitrogen has shifted as you described. But that's a function of how good or bad the soil structure is itself. And then you get an uneven crop, which is a real pain in the ass for the farmer, excuse my French, because of the fact then that they've got part of the crop is bombing on and becoming too good and the other bit isn't getting what it needs and they go back out and apply and stuff like that. So it's that drip feeding of the nitrogen is what you end up getting a uniform crop which means that if it senesces and goes to seed at the same time, so they actually then have the, um, a uniform grain that they then don't have to dry or anything else afterwards. Thank you very much. Great, well, thank you everybody for your questions and particularly thank you to Yog. That was a really great web webinar and thank you for your time um, and effort into that.
And um, yes, please, as ever, please do email um, the CSI address if you have anything else that you'd like to ask um, or any other questions relating to, to CSI or the, or the talk that Jörg has just done. Um, and we'll hopefully have another webinar again um, over the summer, um, towards the end of the summer. All right, so thank you everybody and we'll catch up with you soon. Thank you very much. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye.